So today I'm talking to my friend Connor Inch in Australia. And normally I do these interviews late in the evening, but we did it this one in the morning, as otherwise Connor would have to get up at 3 a.m., which wouldn't be that conducive to a good chat. And Connor is copywriter, marketer, and also the founder of a business called Multiply My Media, which creates custom video marketing for business owners. And we're going to talk about a bunch of stuff today, but it's not going to be all business focused. We're just going to basically chat about how you got into the industry and what's going on with you. Because for me, the people I pick out who I want to do these interviews with, Connor, are basically people who are not balanced in this industry, <laughs> which are rare, I, rare yeah, people. I, I better leave are, this call then, mate. You've, you've made a big mistake. <laughs> people who are, who are honest and straightforward and like, trying to do good. From knowing you the last couple of years, I, I know you're one of those people. So do you want to give a brief introduction about yourself and kind of let us know who you are? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Well, I'm, yeah, Connor and I'm not a bellend apparently. So that's a, <laughs> that's a good place to start. <laughs> brief intro. Yeah. So I, I spent four years as a direct response copywriter and started this year, I moved on to something new. I, I still do copy, but I'm kind of phasing that out slowly mm. and started the Done For You video content service, which has a unique spin on it as, you've, as you, you kind of know yourself, John. Yeah, um, we'll get into that in just a couple of minutes. I like to start people with their beginnings. And when was it that you first typed how to make money on the internet into Google? <laughs> probably as soon <laughs> as I had access to the internet, to be honest. Okay. Um, but when I think, so that's probably the best place to start. Uh, yes. but, you know, I've got a few interesting business ventures before that. I had a little teeth whitening business and then I had a, a topless waitering agency. I think I've seen yeah. pictures of that. You were all oiled up like one of the Chippendales, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, with a little bow tie and stuff. That's a, a disturbing foot. <laughs> Yeah, but, I mean, they used to pay me to take my clothes off, but they, they pay me to put them back on now. Good stuff. <laughs> but yeah, so I was a personal trainer in a small mining town in remote Austin, uh, Western Australia. And mm -hmm. I was, as most personal trainers, looking for leads. And I was listening to podcasts. I think it was Jonathan Goodman and I was into Bedros Carillion and a few other people kind of who were at the time speaking to the fitness niche. I don't know if they still do. And they kept talking about this thing called copywriting. And like most people, I had no clue what that meant uh, to start off with, but they kept saying it. They kept talking about it. Eventually I started to understand it. I was following up a guy called Mike Samuels, who who you know as well, John. Yeah, great. Yeah, an amazing guy. Uh, I, I owe this career to him pretty much. Yeah. So there's a little plug for Mike Samuels there. If you're not following him, give him a he's follow a, for sure. He's a wonderful man. Yeah. So I, I was following Mike because he was kind of speaking to personal trainers about copywriting at the time as well. On his email list for a while, kind of liking his content, what he was putting out. And then one day I was messaging him about, you know, doing a copywriting course for my personal training business and asked if it'd be a good idea. And he said, well, I'm releasing a course on how to become a copywriter soon. And then a little light bulb went off in my head. I was like, okay, this sounds like a great idea. I was dead broke at the time. I'd lost pretty much my entire client base because the town I lived in was a mining town and one of the mining contracts had basically gone. So that was half my client base had to cut personal training. I had a credit card. I paid for Mike's course with a credit card, which he is dead against. Uh, and I do not recommend anyone to do that, but I didn't tell him until about a year after. And uh, yeah, I did his course on how to become a freelance copywriter. And that's how I got into it. That was literally, it's called Freedom Kickstarter. And that literally kickstarted my career. That's awesome. But you said you were living in Western Australia, but you're not from Australia, right? No, no, I'm from Southeast England originally. I'm from Kent. And yeah, I came to Australia kind of on a whim, my brother told me to come. What well, I didn't have much going on in my life at the time. I was a full-time bouncer, <laughs> not really a, a long-term career. And uh, yeah, spoke to my brother on the phone. He was out here and six weeks later, I hopped on a plane to come see him. Amazing. And, uh, yeah, here I am yeah. 10 years later. Yeah, stuff like that is great. Like, that's how I kind of met my wife. You know, I somebody said, come out and do some work on this project. Sent me a plane ticket, went, I flew across the world to... Then two months later, I met my wife at a, at a business deal with a couple of the guys I was working with. That's awesome, man. It's funny how these things go. As yeah. You know, I've got a, I've got Aussie wife and two kids, as you know, as well. So yeah, it's a good decision. <laughs> Fantastic. So after you got into Mike's program, like, where did you, you know, where did you go to next? How did, how did you get going with clients? What was your, what were the methods you used to build up your business? I started off doing cold email and I got some good replies from cold email. Because Mike was teaching a quite a unique principle at the time, quite a unique way of doing it in his course. But nothing really came of it, you know, interest, but I didn't really know what I was doing. I had become friends with Jamie Lynch, who does some stuff with Mike. Uh, yeah. So I networked, and this will be a recurring theme probably throughout this call, and something you're great at too. So I'd networked with a few people who I'd seen, you know, hanging around with Mike or who knew Mike. And 
Jamie introduced me to someone who was looking for a junior copywriter. And that was my first real copywriting gig. I, I Just to backtrack, I had done a couple of small bits for one of my PT clients who owned a business. That was 50 bucks, 100 bucks. Jamie introduced me to this email marketer, Jason Jason Williamson, who was crushing it at the time in e yeah. I'm not sure what he's doing now. but He's big still. He's big in e still. Yeah. So Jason took me under his wing. And the minute I started making money from you know the brands I was looking after for Jason, I reinvested that and I paid Jamie. Jamie Lynch to mentor me so so that I could know what the hell I was doing basically <laughs> because I think doing a course is one thing but going out and then writing copy for clients is is another thing and you know that's not to discredit Mike's course because it was fantastic but I think having that person who was a couple of years ahead of me to check over my copy and give me feedback mm. it gave me just that confidence I needed and also fast-tracked my skills right and we should just insert there that Mike does do that now. He has a mastermind for people after they finish his course to get personal help with developing their skills. Yeah, I, I think Mike just needs to start charging us commission because we're just plugging him so much. We are <laughs> yeah. giving us commission. Sorry, you not get um, the commission. He's he just sent me a check last week. <laughs> it's no, he does. He does have a good mentorship group. I used to copy coach in there with Jamie and Mike and Alexander Mullen and. I believe that group's so good that even though I don't really do copywriting and I don't use the group much, I still pay to be in there as a member now. So yeah, that's, yeah. If you, if you get in, in a position to learn from Mike and Jamie and Alex, I think that's a, a great idea. Fantastic. So you've gotten your first couple of clients with Jamie and what were the early wins looking like? How was, you know, how did you find yourself developing? The early wins were making a lot of money for the email clients with Jason. Turned out I wasn't as awful as I thought I was as quite a copy. So I started doing pretty good job on things like flows, email copy. It's hard to remember exactly what order things went in, but that gave me the confidence to start applying for other gigs. And I had some success with the cult of copy jobs board back then. Yeah, me too. Yeah. And I think a large part of that, and you might've had a similar experience, John, was my, I made my applications interesting. Yeah. I, I just worky. That got me a gig with a really big media buying company in the direct response niche. And I got to write for some huge, huge names pretty early on, just because I had an interesting application and that they kind of threw that, saw the potential. So that was another kind of early win. I probably was underqualified for that position, but mm -hmm. still was a massive learning experience, right? Getting paid to learn. And I think that's, you may have done similar, but that was a really big key to getting to where I am today was seeing things as opportunities to get paid to learn. So not chasing 5K sales pages, 10K sales pages in my first year of copywriting, but being okay with getting 30 bucks an email or doing a $500 or $200 sales page or whatever, and getting the yeah. reps and sets in and learning from legitimate brands. Awesome. I want to just jump in there on that because it's a thing, and this is like a key mistake I made early on where you seem to have done it better than me. I was always very aware of financial pressure. So I was always after money first, early days, and not necessarily thinking about picking and choosing the best long-term opportunities. That kind of held me back in skills development for quite a long while. And I have to, I've had to play catch up since, but like what you did with particularly like working with somebody like Jason, who I know works with a lot of successful e-commerce brands. And also the fact that you've got those gigs on the cult of copy job or with bigger companies, like a big, one of the biggest parts of getting good early days is who you work with because they have the momentum, right? And then even if you're like early stage, you're maybe underqualified or a beginner, if you get a gig with a client, you're going to see, you send out an email for that client, they're going to make some money. <laughs> yeah, even if you just like write copy, 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 copy on the page, some money and I put a link. Some money will come I don't, I don't in. recommend that. Recommend it, but I've seen that happen. Do you see that last week? I can't remember who it was somebody's list them on. They'd sent out like the template email by accident, with, like copy, 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 and then the link, and then they did a follow up letter saying that a couple of sales still came in. Oh man, that's amazing. That's amazing. Um, who you work with is a huge determinant because you, the confidence comes from getting some wins on the board, and. Early days, you don't know what you don't know, but if you just get some stuff going, you'll build the confidence and the confidence is self-reinforcing to keep focusing on, on your skills development. Absolutely. And I just want to add another point to that. <clears throat> it's what I did sounds good, but at the time, man, I was under a lot of pressure, financial pressure as well. My wife was supporting me at the time, you know, and I did fall in the trap of undervaluing myself. When I started getting good, I was still charging, you know, the, the lower prices. So there's that mm -hmm. trap that's easy to fall into as well of not realizing your worth because you're just so used to charging those fees. And there is another trap as well, which is people taking advantage. So like you said, working for the right brands is really important. There's people out there that are looking to pay copywriters for $15 an email or whatever, but they you're not going to gain anything really from working with them because they're just not good brands. 
you talked about the undercharging, knowing your worth. And, you know, like knowing your worth is important, but I also think the problem with like the idea of knowing your worth, knowing your value is that it's very, very subjective. It's hard for people to get it. I, I would always think in terms of like knowing the ROI the client is getting off you. I, you know, if you're doing X and they're making Y, well, this, there's a relationship between those two numbers. And like, there's probably, you know, if you're like creating really good copy, could be anywhere up to 10 to 15% of the revenue they're generating. Like if it's an info product, definitely. If it's e-commerce, it's much lower because they have high cogs, cost of goods sold. But for info products, like good copy is a huge needle mover. If you know they're making, you know, 50 grand off an email from you, well, paying you $50 is a little bit, it's a bit, it's a bit low. They should be probably paying you more than that. Or you should have a deal with them where you're taking a piece of the action. You're getting a bit of upside bonus on the, the performance you drive for them. Yeah, absolutely agree. You run the risk as well if you don't do that of resenting the work that you're doing for these people as well. So it's not a good thing to undercharge because then you're not doing your best for the client because you start, yeah, you start in some cases resenting it. And yeah, just the, the cold copy job where it's funny, like people, people don't really see the value in it and it's a super valuable place to be. You know, I think some of the difficulties it's had in recent years is that it grew so much and there was a lot of, and uh, newcomers came in and they just kind of, a lot of people just spam the board with, here are my rates and here's what I do and make some big claim with no proof supporting us. But there are, I found like you that I got good results off the cold copy job board when I took the time to write an interesting story and then basically have a lead with an interesting story and then segue into a into a quick offer and a, and a CTA, just, just like you're doing a landing page. I still remember your post on cold of copy about getting robbed. Just, oh yeah, that uh, was a good one. Yeah, that was a so that is ingrained into my memory that story, man. So yeah, you're right. Yeah. You know that that stuck with me. So imagine how many potential, you know, clients saw that and and thought the same thing. Yeah, if you're gonna do job boards, you, you need to stand out. And it's just like think about it like a piece of copy for a client. Write it just like it's a landing page. You know, stick an interesting lead in there, grab their attention first. And then segue over to what's your offer and give them a clear CTA. Let them know how to do business with you. Treat applica- applying for gigs the same way as well. <clears throat> don't write, a, you know, you've got to judge the client as well. Sometimes they'll tell you, I don't want to see it. You know, I don't want you to write me a sales page, just apply. Fair enough. But some of them want to see that, you know, write a little story or, or make the email interesting. And that's what I was talking about when I applied for gigs there, applying for them, just doing something different from what everyone else is doing and being good enough to do that as well. So, yeah, do you want to just dig into that with a couple of examples of the kind of things that, you know, you did to stand out from the crowd? Absolutely. So one that springs to mind, the big media buyer agency, and I can't remember the specifics of what I wrote, right? Because this is going back to 2019 or 2020. I can't remember. It was basically five reasons why you should consider hiring me. And I researched the brand and I tied everything back to the brand, but I also made it quirky. So I did little things like I leveraged the fact that I was a bouncer, that I moved to Australia and that I have kids to leverage the fact that I have life experiences. I understand empathy. I've seen people at their worst and at their best, just little things like that. Right. So, and, and tying it all back to, to them and their brand and, and going on their website and looking at their mission statement, stalking their staff, you know, the upper management and finding out what the company's about and just tying everything back to that and what they've said in the application. So they tell you in applications what they're looking for, like mm-hmm. half the job's done for you. So when you're then reaching out, just, just tie that back, you know, and, and always thinking of that principle, you know, what's in it for me. So if I brag, I need to tie that back, not just leave it as a brag, but tie that back into, you know, the benefit of, of that brag to them or the benefit of a skill set I have to them as, as the client. So, yeah. So, and which means that you get this. That's the easiest way to do it, which means. Yeah. Yeah. And like the thing with the applications is like, it's such a basic thing. Like whenever I see a gig that I want to apply for, and make an application, which I don't do as much anymore these days because I focus so much on networking the past couple of years and I get a lot of inbound. But when I do occasionally see a gig I want to apply, all I always do is copy the whole app, copy the whole post, paste that into a Google Doc, and then start to break it out line by line, like it's a piece of copy for editing, and then just use that as a starting point for writing the application, just responding to the stuff they said in the in their post. Absolutely. I I do exactly. I did the exact same thing. I I went through a phase and not to sound like I'm bragging, but when I was in Copy Accelerator, which perhaps we'll talk about later, and they had the jobs board in there where probably for about six months, every gig I applied for, I got, or I got a really good response from. 
just through taking the time to do that. And and I, I had some, so admittedly, you know, not, not to mislead anyone, I had some good strong testimonials by that point. And I yeah. had a good portfolio, but that definitely helped, right? Everyone else is just applying, doing the same old application. I'm doing what you've done. I've taken the application word for word, put my own spin on it, use the framework that I kind of, cre- you know, kind of created, which isn't hundred percent original to me. You know, it's, it's kind of, I, I had taken a few different frameworks I'd seen online and made my own version of it. So yeah, that there's, there's a lot of power in, in doing that kind of thing. We can, we'll move on to this in a minute. Just like those job boards are still can be super valuable and, you know, don't be fooled by thinking that there's lots of just a bunch of beginners on there. There are people with real money on those job boards who are a posting their gigs now and then and b just checking it, just scrolling it every now and every time, every week for a couple of times, just to see what's going on and maybe, you know, reach out to a couple of people. So it is worth putting some attention to them, especially that one, the, the cult of copy job board and nothing held back job board. Those are the two I still regularly just keep my eye on to see what's going on. Yeah, absolutely. And and it's very easy to, I know in the past, right, to, I've done this and other copywriters do this a lot. Perhaps people listening to this will relate as well, to think that you can only find jobs in the Nothing Held Back Jobs Board or the Copy Accelerator Jobs Board when that was a thing. So going into places like Cult of Copy or other boards, you can find gems in there because not every client knows about Nothing Held Back or mm-hmm. Copy Accelerator, right? So yeah, looking outside of our own sphere is is super powerful because uh, it's very easy to just get tunnel vision and think the only clients are the big clients that we see hosting on these and these areas. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, let's move on. So like you've been, you're doing copy for a couple of years and when did you get to a point where you realized, hey, you know, work for other people is great, but I want to build something that's more like a business and have a team around it. Oh man, I felt that way for quite a while. I tried my first step to to get away from that, or sorry, to move in that direction was to hire other copywriters to help me write copy for my clients. Mm-hmm. So they do the first draft and I'd go through and, and edit it. And while that was good, like I found, I found a really good copywriter who I, I'm friends with now. I still, still a lot of creative energy went into that, right? And I, I started to feel like I, I can't have a business that relies on me, my energy, my mood, my sleep, my mm-hmm. workload and stuff like that. I need something that doesn't rely on me so heavily for the day-to-day stuff, right? something that can scale beyond, you know, 20, 30 K a month and doesn't require, like I said, my brain power all the time to exist. So that was, that was a large part of why I wanted to own my own thing that wasn't, wasn't copy. And so what things have you tried on the way to making that happen? It was, it was just hiring other, other copywriters, right? Cause I didn't know what to do. I think a lot of people will relate to that, right? Where you don't know what to do, but you don't know what you don't know. Right. So I think end of last year, I started working with a guy called Charlie Valher. He's Australian. He's a media buyer, but he's a very, he's owned a lot of big businesses. He's more than just a media buyer. He's got his fingers in a lot of pies. Really talented guy. So he started coaching me and we were kind of banging our heads together, trying to figure out, you know, what skills do I have and what's needed out there? And we kind of started to talk more and more about video. So I didn't come up with the idea fully to go into video myself. It was like, I had this other person who extrapolated my skills and experiences and kind of made me see, right? Cause it's hard to see for yourself what you're good at, Absolutely, especially yeah. when you're, you're in the trenches. So he helped me extrapolate that. And yeah, it kind of progressed from there. So that was end of last year. And then start of this year, I'd kind of refined what I wanted to offer, which is a whole another thing we can talk about in a bit, if you want to, how I ended up with the business I have today. No, get into it. You're, it's on your mind now. So let's talk about it now. Yeah, sweet. So there's a lot of factors that went into it. I knew short form was in demand. Short form video content was in demand. Yeah. I also knew that there's a lot of shit short form content out there and that's not what I wanted to make. That kind of Hormozy style stuff that everyone's doing. Well, and that's not that's not to shit on Hormozy, by the way. Yeah, because he's doing it great, but a bunch of people are just doing shit copy pasta of what he's doing because they 100%. think they think that, you know, this guy's got massive media team. So the way he does it, he can do it. But trying to do the way he does it as a solopreneur or one, two person team ain't going to work out the same. You've got to do things in a different way. No, exactly. I agree. And he is Alex Hormozy. Yeah, you know, you are not Alex Hormozy. I am not Alex Hormozy. He, he's even said himself that copying him is a bad idea, right? It's, it's yeah. not going to work for you. He's he said that. So, so okay. So, we, so I've got that side of things. And then in my copywriting business, I'd done a lot of script writing like script writing and advertorials and high ticket sales pages for like high ticket coaching programs, especially fitness were kind of my jam. That's, that's what I was just continually getting rehired for. I always found with, with scripts and I would often do scripts for content as well, that the presenter never quite did it good. And I could never quite get, you know, as a copywriter, we have to become the person, right? But you can't, there's only so far you can go 
Like, for example, I did a call the other week to be a recording session with someone who's got 17 years in the industry. There's no way that I can learn his 17 years of experience, no matter how much research I do, how much I interview him. Because yep. it's, yeah, what did you catch him on a different day? He'll remember different things, right? So, so I know I found that the scripts, the ideas I had in my head, even if I gave stage directions and, and visual cues and stuff like that, which I often did, the videos never came out very good. And people are really shit at reading scripts as well. Mm -hmm. uh, especially business owners if they if it's a presenter that's different right if they've got a professional presenter for the business then then that's cool so i just kind of was reverse engineering everything and thinking how can i offer something that fixes the problems and is unique and different because people were already offering we'll write your scripts and shoot the content for you blah 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 that's already been done and i thought well, what about if we get rid of the scripts so they don't need to hire a copywriter or they don't need to write their own scripts they don't need to awkwardly read scripts you know, stand there monotone, staring at the camera like that, reading a script and looking at the script like that and then going back. So, which people do. I mean, I testament to this, when I launched the business, I shot a three minute VSL and it took me the best part of a day to record three minutes because I just kept screwing it up, stumbling my words. I, I, I thought I was smiling, but I was deaf staring into the camera. My, my video editor, when I submitted him the first video, he was like, this is really good, sir, but can you please not stare at the camera and can you smile a bit more <laughs> he was being so polite to me you know he was, he was very kind and i said are you saying this is rubbish and he's like yes it is i got i got so, just one interesting thing to say there you probably are aware of this guy called casey neistat that youtube vlogger yeah and he always has seen he's rarely seen without his sunglasses on and i always thought maybe he's got weird eyes or something like that maybe there's a reason why he hides his eyes but i recently found out the reason he keeps the sunglasses on he says is i don't have to look at the camera I can be looking away. I can be looking at my notes and nobody ever notices while I'm shooting. I can be, I can be looking at my little monitor to make sure the st shot's still in frame and composition is good. And that's all it is. <laughs> oh, yeah. Now you've said that we're going to see a bunch of hormozy reels of people with their uh, sunglasses. <laughs> on. So yeah, that I was just thinking there's, there's so much difficulty in recording videos for, especially for business owners, right? That video is not their zone of genius. Writing scripts is not their zone of genius. Recording, reading scripts, not their zone of genius. Their zone of genius is creation. It's idea. It, it's delivering the service, right? Yeah. but they know they need to have video content yes so i thought let's try this scriptless thing so how do how can i do that well why don't i i you know research the brand get to know the brand and then create topics for them to talk about so that was the first idea i had okay that's cool but then what if they don't really know what you know i've given them the, to the topics great what do they do with them they're not too sure they need direction so why don't mm -hmm. i hop on a call with them and a bit like we're doing now why don't i talk about the topics with them why don't i direct them why don't i if they say something really good get them to double down on that or if they've said something and that could be a hook get them to say that in a way that would hook people in help them create call to actions that make sense on the fly and things like that so through that iterating you know my thought process this didn't happen overnight it took me a few weeks to refine we basically come up with we'll write the topics for you we'll meet on a virtual recording session once a month and we'll talk about these topics where i'll direct you and prompt you we'll chop that recording up into short form clips on each topic we'll edit them in a style that suits your brand generally we want them to look different from hormozy reels that everyone else is doing we want them to look a bit better so we want them to have your branding we'll you know we use all the client assets so images b-roll stuff like that and then the final pain point that people have is then writing the post that needs to go with that video so i was like screw it <laughs> we'll write the post for you as well and no that's not that's not the final pain point so i use my copywriting we do the hashtags as well the final pain point is managing and posting all of those videos you have so some of my clients have 30 30 videos uh, a month so that's daily posting right some of my clients have social media ma team have a social media team already so they do that great but if they don't we do it for them uh, really? across all platforms so it literally has removed as far as i can see and uh, my clients will say the same thing it's removed every pain point around creating videos i mean for me i guess in the most emotionally painful point was just standing in front of the camera and reading the script that they probably hated that because i've seen people be really wooden and you can tell from the look on their face the lips go away they're just not enjoying the experience it's, it's terror it's mask. i think you, if you enjoy speaking on camera then you're probably a little bit psychopathic oh yeah. I, I do but you know <laughs> watch I, out i have a method uh, if i try and stand here in my office and record a video it rarely comes out good like i can have some notes help me but there'll be ums and ahs and a lot of kind of pregnant pauses although i think generally speaking i like to pause rather than say mm, ah. so i'll remind myself just take a breath pause it's not going to hurt you 
and you can you can even trim it out in Descript later because Descript is such a powerful tool these days. But what I found for me is if I've got a video that I want to talk about something and I don't want to write a script, I want to just kind of go off of like how I'm thinking and feeling about it. I get in the car and record in the, while driving because something about focusing on the road where I'm not focusing on the camera or thinking about what I'm looking like lets me tap into my subconscious mind and I can get the words out with a nice smooth flow when I'm driving. Yeah, I, I've noticed that your your car videos are very coherent and very they're good. So that yeah, that works for you. I think that's a smart idea. I guess the way we kind of simulate that is you're talking to a person. So I, I have a client who doesn't like being on camera and we record for his iPhone. I have the the app that we use and he likes to set it up. He likes me. He asked me to move my seat up or down so that when he's talking, he's looking at me in the eyes like he's talking to me like we're having a chat now. Yes. Because um, that works for him because he's talking to a person. He's not talking to a phone anymore. And that just subconsciously changes the way he speaks on camera and he becomes confident. He loosens up and he starts sharing his thoughts properly. So yeah, I totally get that. You you need something to focus on when you're talking, whether that's a person or driving or whatever makes you loosen up, right? Yeah. And just for context, for anyone watching this, I did went through this process with Connor a few weeks ago and we did about 30, 30 35 minute session together. And it was Oh, what you want to go ahead? You want to say something? Uh, I, was, I was just going to add in there that we didn't we didn't plan it properly, right? Right? It wasn't. I didn't give you the full experience, John. It was just like a, yeah. It was a, I, you know, I, I had a few things going on, right? So we just we hopped on unorganized. I hadn't created the topics for you, for example. So mm -hmm. even then, you you didn't get you got partial experience, right? Okay, got it. But just from from doing that with you, it was like yeah, it was more like as you said, a conversation. I didn't feel like I was just reading off a script because I wasn't. You were feeding me, okay, let's talk about this. Now let's talk about this. And as I was, you know, saying, you know, my responses to your questions and prompts, you were also saying, hey, that one went great. Or, you know what, that one was a bit stiff. Let's try it again. Or, yeah, that came out a bit the wrong way. Maybe you should just approach it from this angle. Or have you considered this? And let's, let's do that one again. And just doing that, we were able to like get a lot of stuff out in a short space of time. And then you went ahead and produced me some reels and I've stuck them up on my Facebook and my YouTube and they got a lot of views. They got thousands of views. And I mean, the first day I put them up, I got a thousand dollars saying out of that reel straight away. So that was amazing. Like that was so good. Yeah, that's awesome, man. I was, I was stoked when you told me about that. And the, the, the other thing as well, it's almost like having a copy chief live, live chiefing you while you're on the call. Right. So mm -hmm. you would say some things and I'd just say, so what's the benefit of that? Because because yeah. you're you know you're focused on what you're saying right, but I'm I'm hearing what you're saying. I'm thinking okay, put myself in the audience's shoes. What does that mean to them? So yeah, there's little things like that. You've got that up there. It's just helping you un unlock it. Absolutely, and that's the classic biz owner biz owner problem is that they know the service too well. They say here's what we do. They talk about this feature, and then they forget to explain to someone who maybe doesn't understand it as well why that feature matters and what it can do for other people and. Just there, yeah, having somebody prompt you with that and say, hey, so what does this mean? What is the outcome that leads to? Why is that so valuable? Can you explain it in simple language that someone who's not an expert will understand? All that stuff helps you create a, a better picture, a more understandable explanation and, and vision of what it is that you do and why people might want to work with you. Absolutely. And that might mean that one topic takes three or four minutes to record and we only, we only use 45 seconds of that, but the 45 seconds we use of that is clear, compelling structured and and really brings out the best right so we cut all the waffle and all of that stuff and it, yeah it's just the good stuff that's that's up there that's in your brain yeah on display for everyone to see so like more broad you know so you create short form video for people what are you seeing in terms of like how important that is to people's overall mix of content they're putting out there how does short form video lead potentially new customers into your clients funnels good question so my views on this have changed when I launched, I saw short form video uh, only useful as a way to get people into your world. I've completely changed my stance on that. While I think that is still the case, it's a good way to get people into your world. It also warms people up a lot. So I'm having uh, it's a guy I work with, Matt. He's in the high ticket advertising space for, for the roofing and home improvement niche. He's the number one advertiser in that niche in the US. Nice. Yeah. And, and he's telling me, you know, people are coming on the call when they've consumed a lot of his content and they're a lot warmer. They have questions about the videos. They're like, oh, you said this on the video, you know, can, can you prove it? And stuff like that. So they're coming in, they're, they're, they're sitting there in the background, silently consuming. It's like emails, right? Mm -hmm. I, I kind of get that, draw that comparison to email where you're nurturing someone, you're doing the same with video. So, so yes, they help get people in, 
but more importantly, they're warming up people who are already, already in your audience. So that's where I think consistency with the videos matters too. I'd go even further. I would say they're almost like commercial breaks on television. Yes, yes, yeah. That's, that's people are on YouTube, they're watching long form video and then they get a bunch of shorts in between or, you know, that comes up on the afternoon. And on Facebook, when you're scrolling, you get, you know, you'll, you'll every you now and again watch a video and then you'll watch another one, you'll watch a few reels afterwards and stuff about people pops in. And you do, like, it's not, no, there's no one silver bullet, but each one in real you see of a person. I can think of a few influencers who are really good at this. Given one example is that guy, Tanner Chittister. Like he yeah. puts up lots of short videos and reels all the time. And, you know, no one particular one of them stands out. But over the last few months, I've seen so much of his stuff that I've got a pretty good picture of who he is and what he's about in my head. And that's kind of how it is. It's incremental. It's exactly that. And I also use this, this, I guess, kind of analogy is, would you rather have someone who has downloaded a lead magnet is at the PDF is sitting on your hard, you know, sitting on their hard drive. They don't consume it. They don't read it. Or would you rather have someone who's consumed 10, 20, 30, one minute clips of your videos who, do you know what I mean? Coming in to a sales call or, or starting a conversation with you, you know, they know you, they like, they like you, they trust you. And, and that's the thing about video as well as it feels personal, like email and mm-hmm. um, people feel like they get to know you. That's why think about YouTubers, right? People feel like they know YouTubers. You hear them talk, famous YouTubers talking about people coming up in the street and talking to them because they see them on, they see them all the time, right? There's that familiarity and they feel like they know them. So it's a similar thing happening with video that they're consuming like micro, want of a better term, micro doses of your content on a regular basis. And it's building that familiarity and and trust and uh, intrigue. I mean, I work with a few people in like a coaching program I've got, which is about networking and part of that is like talking about the content creation side and while it's good to have text-based posts and content and your emails out there and posts on Facebook or wherever other and, and Twitter whatever the social networks you're active on like there's there's a different dimension to people seeing your face and hearing your voice because you know our animal nature is what it is we make decisions we we make and for better or worse, you know, this leads to all kinds of nasty stuff as well. But for better or worse, we make snap decisions about people. Do I like that person's face? Do I like the sound of their voice? You know, is their voice compelling and appealing to me? Or does it sound like nails on a blackboard? If it sounds like the teacher's nails being dragged down the blackboard, you might be a wonderful person, but that person is never doing business with you. That's just a fact. And that can, you know, work in your favor. It can work against. Luckily, there's different, lots of different people in the world and you may turn some people right off and you'll appeal to this other bunch of people but letting them see and hear you is a huge part and even just your body language do they like your demeanor are you do you seem relaxed and comfortable do you seem intense and high energy what way are you and some and each of those qualities will appeal to some and and put off others but at least getting your face and voice out there you get to find your people a little bit better than i think just with words on a page yeah absolutely couldn't agree more cool so You've you just launched this year. Do you want to talk a little bit about how it's going so far and, and what your plans are for the next 12 months? Absolutely. So yeah, it's gone well. Growing slow and steady. Probably, honestly, a little slower than, than I wanted, but that's kind of been a good thing, right? Because there's lots of kinks to iron out when you start a quote unquote real business. And there's a lot of things you don't know. And I've certainly screwed up a few things, especially at the start. It always seems, <laughs> it always seems to be that you have the one client where everything goes wrong for them every time. So that's, that's been a good learning experience that was early on. So that slow growth, instead of me ramping up and scaling, you know, to, you know, 50 clients or whatever, straight off the bat, that slow growth has allowed me to really iron out the process and dial stuff in. So the next phase for me is we're spending the last half of this year, ramping up the growth. Now that we've kind of ironed out all the kinks the systems and things like that. I also changed, I was, I started off and I just wanted to work with health and fitness brands niche I'm familiar with, but I'm familiar with a lot of niches, but it's one I was, I come from, right? But I found out that people that wanted this service the most weren't in that niche. It's B2B business owners. So, so I I diversified who we help. I do, I've kind of, we've kind of gone against the rules of, you know, niching down and we're just kind of generalizing with a, with a focus on B2B. We still work with fitness brands, doing some stuff with a doctor soon, which is going to be super good and a, a men's health kind of fitness brand working with them as well. But yeah, that's the main focus growth for the for the last half of this year. Big challenges. I, I mentioned challenges. So as well as processes and systems has been in learning how to manage a team. I went in wanting to be really cruisy and relaxed with the team, treat them how I wanted to be treated as a freelancer. I inadvertently was creating a toxic work culture by doing that because there were some who were performing, you know, at a certain level and others who perhaps weren't. And now everyone's on board 
you know, we've got boundaries. Everyone knows what's expected of them and, and the team's working really well. But yeah, lots of little things like that that you kind of <laughs> figure out along the way. I definitely had a lot of help from Charlie as well, who I mentioned earlier, Charlie Valher, because he's had team, he's had teams in the hundreds, right? He's managed large teams. So he's helped me avoid a lot of painful mistakes there too. So look, you know, with team, I have, you know, this is something I've tried repeatedly and just hasn't worked for me. I haven't found the right mix. I've hired people, but then of course you start to get into then understanding that hiring people, you have to take a completely different view on pricing your services than when you're a solopreneur because there's so much more goes into the mix of working out a price that become that can be profitable for you, where it's super simple, when it's just you, it's just how much do I want to make? How many hours are I going to put into this? And that's how much I charge. But once you start to put a team, you know that brings in complexity and you have to start thinking about pricing your services in a different way. So how have you met that challenge? I've always been pretty good with numbers. So a lot of people who I'm close to in the copywriting world will know that because I have, I've shared like spreadsheets and stuff with them. So despite being a creative type personality type, I have been good with numbers. So that hasn't been a huge challenge. It has been hard to get my head around the fact that when I get money in, most of it's not going to me yet. It's going to my team. It's going to that kind of stuff. So that, that was definitely a, a challenge. Yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. And you mentioned that also that you thought it was going to be fitness businesses who would want this service, but it's turned out that it's been more of the B2B space. And it's interesting you said that because I don't know if you know him. There's a guy called Sam Ocean. Yeah, I I think I follow him on Twitter. Yeah, I, I've known Sam for a couple of years. We've, we've chatted quite a bunch of times and he's been building out a kind of personal branding service where he more, it's more like rather than just like one service where you're very clear boundaries and what you do his is more of a kind of like broad consultancy thing where he works with a business founder on building their personal brand and that can be in multiple dimensions but it's interesting he's saying this that there's lots of people out there who have money have been successful in another industry and like the the reason they want to do this do video or create these other assets or create an offer is yeah they want to and other income stream, but they also just want to get known. They want to be seen and be a, a visible personality in whatever their space is. Have you found the same thing? Yeah. So while we strive to get an ROI for our clients, like we want this to be a profitable venture for them. There mm -hmm. are some clients I've worked with who just want to look good and who want to, to share, you know, awareness of their brand and, and what they've achieved and yeah, contribute to that, to that personal brand. So, so there are people who just, they want to look good. They don't want to spend hours creating the video content. They want to have good video content for the least effort possible. Yeah. So yeah, and absolutely. If you're in, you know, a very marketing driven space like fitness, you're pro a lot of people in that space are going to probably be quite media savvy anyway, because it's what the industry th thrives on. Whereas if you're in a different type of business, like you said, with your client example of something like roofing, you know, you probably understand that social media could be super valuable to you because there are people who are making a big noise in every industry on their but maybe you don't have the access to that to those skill sets yourself personally because that's not where you've come up or you don't even have it in your team and you wouldn't even know how to start building a marketing team like that inside your business. So those people can be a great, like a, it's a great way to add that into a company that doesn't have it already, right? Yeah, I mean, the, just to expand on that, there are so many niches out there. And as a copywriter, I've got tunnel vision with niches and, and industries. But with this business, I'm, I'm seeing- <laughs> Get paid, too. get laid, lose weight, right? Pretty much. <laughs> yeah, exactly that. But there's so many niches out there that I didn't even know could benefit from video until I started having conversations with people. You know, I'm, I'm speaking to people at the moment in like logistics industries who, who are really interested in the video. That springs to mind as, as an unusual one that I hadn't thought of. So, and, and you think about it, like some of these businesses, they only need to make one sale and they've got a huge ROI on, on, my, on my services already. Mm -hmm. And their competitors aren't doing this stuff either. So it's, it's yeah. almost like a, a, an open market, you know, that there's people spending big money, there's demand for the service, but people are shit at marketing, you know, and that's, that's the kind of industries where we're having the most impact. That's not to say that in more saturated industries, the video is not working either because they are. So I work with like a copywriting guru uh, and she's getting great results from, from her videos as well. So, and that's quite a saturated space. Awesome. Yeah. There's, I mean, there's another good example I've seen here in Ireland. There's a woman, I can't remember what's happening. Her, her business is like, doesn't matter what her business name is, but She's in, she's got a car dealership. She's a very upmarket car dealership. She's nobody spending less than a hundred to 150,000 when they go and buy a car off her. But like, that's a space where there's a, a bunch of established players. They're all very conservative. They have their website. They advertise in the usual places. And there's tons and tons of car content out there in the journalism, the review side. 
But she said, I'm going to take that type of content, video content, bring it into the dealership side, use it to promote my dealership. But then she did something else on top. She put some copywriting principles into play. She doesn't start with her car, with her reviews of her vehicles that she's got for sale as a review. She starts every one with a kind of cinematic cut, like set piece that's yeah. based on a famous movie. So she's, you know, got something like an Aston Martin to sell. She will do a James Bond style cutscene with her media team, with her in the in the central role. She, and she does stuff like she hires farmers with massive like combine harvesters. She hires helicopter drivers. It's expensive stuff, but it makes sense the level she's pitched at. And every bit of video she's putting out there is like unique and stands way out. It's nothing like anything else I've seen out there from other people in that space. And so she's now put herself in this category of one where people can buy the same vehicle from a bunch of other people, but they're going to buy it because either they have seen it, their spouse has seen it on Instagram, and they're like, this is cool. Yeah, comes back to what you said about the whole commercial analogy, right? They, they see it, you, you're then top of mind. There's so many markets I can think of where they could benefit so much from from good video or good copy, right? Not to just, you know, promote video the whole time, you know, just having good copy. Like buyer's agents, for example, I don't know if you call them that over in the UK, but people that want to buy a house, you know, high, wealthy people that want to buy houses, for example, people that do that for them, you know, buy investment properties and hook them up with good deals, you know, the, the financial space tax, all that kind of stuff. So much opportunity there. And they generally are, are making a lot of money per sale. So this kind of stuff, whether that be copy or video is is very beneficial to them. When it comes to your go-to-market strategy, and I know you've been kind of doing things on a personal scale where you've been using networking to build your client base up to now because you wanted to work with people, like a limited number of people on a limited size, as you've proved out the service. But now that you're planning to grow it, do you are you going to eat your own dog food? Will you use your own service to promote your business or will you go to, will you still continue to use other forms of marketing to grow your business i honestly feel like with the way things have been going that networking is going to be the fundamental tool to growth right it, think about i've got a client who really really likes my service and they've made so many introductions for me you know they kind of scream from the roof so i think it only takes a few a few good clients who really enjoy your service who are well connected to to grow hey dads is tempting but it's not something i'm going to explore yet we also can't take on a ton of clients at one time, right? Because this is a very bespoke, high level, high touch service. So every time we take on a couple of clients, I have to hire a new team member. So so growth is limited. I, I will take on two or three clients a month max. So a, as it stands at the moment, the the way what I'm doing is working well enough for what we do. Long term, maybe I will look at you know advertising in the future, but I I, I think this business, because of what we do, it's gonna be it's all gonna be all about networking and doing a good job for the clients we have and and serving the right clients right so one yeah. good client can then multiply into several clients yeah i've seen the same i've got i i can think about of a bunch of clients i've worked with in the past two years who are all downstream of one person one yeah, person same. who i met made one introduction to another person and that person made an introduction to about eight or nine other people and it's all just downstream of one conversation and that's like i think that is the leverage power networking that people often don't see they think like you're going to have to talk to hundreds of thousands of people. You probably will at the beginning, but after a while, it's, you start to talk to a smaller number of people, but they're all insanely qualified to be great clients for your business. Yeah, absolutely. I, I can think of a, a few people as well who are responsible for, they're not responsible directly for my revenue, but the introductions they've made, the work I've done for them. Uh, and that all comes down to, yeah, just not to go too deep, too deep but a, a big part of it's luck, right? You, you get the right client. But then you kind of create your own luck as well by doing the activities you need to do to get those clients. So, but yeah, I can definitely think of a few people in the copywriting side of things where they, I've done a good, really good job for them multiple times. They are well connected. So they've introduced me to this person and this person and this person. And then that person has introduced me to another person. It's just got, and it just goes on like that, you know, potentially forever to, to add to that, to anyone listening as well. It's important to plant the seed of referrals. I think that's important to just discuss with your client once you've done a good job. Hey, you know, it, is there anyone else you know that you could introduce me to? I think if you don't ask, you don't get. Who else do you know who needs this? It's like, yeah, it's such a simple it. question. A lot of people don't even bother to ask it. Yeah, and do it on a call as well. When you're on a call, catching up with them or something. So um, they can't air you when you send them as a text message. <laughs> <laughs> They're on the spot and they have to give you an answer. Yeah, I mean, I don't I do not do it for that reason, but that, <laughs> I, I guess thinking about it, that does kind of put them on the spot, doesn't it? It's good. Sometimes like, you have to put people on the spot. Yeah, you do. And and not to digress too much, but I think that's that's something a lot of copywriters won't don't do or won't do. Even when you're speaking to a potential client, right? Sometimes you have to take the reins. 
because they're ideas people a lot of clients are ideas people so that they have all these ideas bouncing around the place you're like right what we need to do now is this so i'm going to send you a proposal for this and then we can look at the other stuff so yeah sometimes you have to you have to lead people not in an aggressive way not in a douchebag way you're not trying to extract as much as you can you just you're there to help that's the way i see it and if you can give them clarity and kind of lead people in the right direction then then you're helping them I mean, creative ideas, people, the, the thing that challenges them the most tends to be like overwhelmed. And I'm, I'm, I'm seeing this in in the situation with some people I'm working with now. There's one person involved in the project, the team, super creative, lots of great ideas, but has too many of them and yeah. brings them all to the table. It's, whoa, 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 this is overwhelming. <laughs> like, Let's get on board with this one thing. Let's get moving on this one thing. And all these other things are great. Why don't we just write them in a list? But we can't do them all at once. We've got limited resources as human beings. Yeah, exactly. I, like I was on a call today with someone and they were, we started off with one thing, then went on to a few different things. And I, I brought it back at the end of the call to the one thing that we we initially went on the call for. Let's do that first. Then we can look at the other stuff. Otherwise you achieve nothing. You just yeah. bounce ideas around you. You feel like your brain's melted and you, you've, yeah, you've made no actual real progress other than talking to someone for an hour. And that can be hard to do when you're in the position of they're your client and you feel like maybe they have all the power, but a lot of times they, they're looking for that. They're looking for you to simplify things and they'll be glad of you showing the leadership. And it, it's a way of providing value for money for the service they're hiring you for. Yeah, it's not a power play. You're not competing for power and, and you've got to read the situation as well. Not not everyone, you can't do that with everyone, but sometimes mm-hmm. they, like I said before, they need that clarity and, and you're there to make their life easier. So yeah, I, I know so many people that miss out on opportunities. Like I've got this great opportunity and they're just for months are just backwards and forwards with people on the idea when you know when i was a copywriter and and you you'd be very similar i imagine john we were able to close a lot quicker and get the client results because we've 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 seen all their ideas and we're kind of like this is what we need to do this is what we need to focus on so let's do this first yeah i mean even if it's not perfect you know it doesn't matter it's more like just getting something done a lot of the time is the most important thing you can do because that's where the momentum starts from and it doesn't have to be perfect the first time but getting stuff moving getting it out of off a piece of paper or off the table of just chatting about ideas into something that's out there and we can see if it works or not that's a huge huge bridging part that a lot of people maybe don't move to towards quick enough yeah for sure i i can say the client i've written for who's probably had the best results and i write for him i still write for him moves fast he gets an idea. He moves fast. From that attitude, we created a, a a an offer two or three years ago that is still pulling in six figures a month. That was just an idea, but he moved fast. He's like, I've got this idea. Can you flesh it out for me? This is what I need. Let's go. So yeah, and he's still an ideas guy, but he's he's I guess he's got the good balance of knowing when what to focus on at any given time. So if if your client's not like that, you need to be that person. Awesome, Connor. Before we wrap up. Where can people find you? Man, I like having conversations, right? So just Facebook, I think, is, is my preferred place for people to reach out. Connor Inch, C-O-N-N-O-R, and Inch, as in the measurement, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. That's the that's the best place. If you want to check out my my website, you can, but you're better off probably talking to me. But the website is Multiply My Media Co. I'm not really doing copywriting work uh, except for existing clients. But if anyone does want to uh, talk about copywriting, they can. If you're an up-and-coming copywriter and you enjoyed this, you just want to chat as well, always happy to connect. And yeah, you can see Connor, ConnorInch.com is my copywriting website. If you want to stalk me there as well, feel free. Okay, brilliant. Thanks so much, mate. I appreciate you doing this. It's good. I think this one conversation has been interesting because it's shown how the, you know you can create a path from being a freelancer, copywriter, service provider into turning that into a package service that then you can build a business around, which is really awesome. I love it. No, thanks, man. I appreciate it. I just want to drop one more thing as well for, for any copywriter who one day wants to do this kind of stuff. Start getting business savvy now as well. Uh, a lot of copywriters have no business sense. You know, They don't know how to do proposals. They don't know how to invoice. They don't know how to just be a good business person. They don't know their numbers. And I'm not saying you have to be anal about it, right? If that's not your personality type, but just have some kind of awareness and business acumen because that will serve you in the long run as a copywriter, but also as a future offer owner. Yeah. And even now when you're serving clients, it lets clients... If guys can see that you understand how their business works, it gives them that little bit more confidence that you're going to be a useful, valuable team member to them. Yeah, 100%. 100%. Awesome. It's been a great conversation. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Connor, and we'll talk soon. Cheers, mate. Thank you. I'll stop the recording now.